when we visit uh, other parliaments, one of the key recommendations we make is that mindfulness practitioners within that legislature or within that country map out the best practice, the mindfulness best practice that is in their country already and look at best practice around the world. So it's an, it's an integral step in setting up uh, mindfulness within a parliament. So well done on that and well done for everybody uh, for, for participating on this webinar. The first slide there uh, shows the World Health Organization's prediction that by 2030, uh, uh, depression will be the biggest cause of human suffering on the whole of the planet. And we're already getting there. Uh, when I saw this statistic a number of years back, I put down some parliamentary questions on, uh, on mental health and mental well-being and flourishing. And the answers that came back were truly devastating. That um, I asked for the incidence of uh, a mental illness, or one or more mental illnesses in each 10-year cohort. And from 15 to 24, 32.3% uh, of young people in that group have one or more psychiatric condition. And for the next 10 years, 25 to 35, it's uh, 30%. So there's a huge cohort in the UK and probably across the world that is coming through society uh, who have these, uh, who are li living, working and existing suboptimally. Another statistic said that 90% of the prisoners in British jails have one or more psychiatric con condition and a devastating statistic that in 1991, there were 9 million prescriptions written for antidepressants. By 2011, that had grown to 49 million, a 500% increase, and today it's 65 million. So it's gone from 9 million prescriptions for antidepressants to 65 million in 26 years. This uh, shows the House of Commons, and it shows the House of Commons in a bubble. And if you shake that bubble, there will be little bits of snow. I presume you know what snow is in Australia. <laughs> There'll be little bits of snow that, 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 that descend and eventually settle in that institution. And that's the same in our mind as mindfulness practitioners. You'll know uh, about this, that we need to distill our mind <clears throat> to get more clarity as an individual, but also as an institution. I started practicing mindfulness about 10 years ago. Uh, after five years practicing it, I thought I would take it back to my workplace, the House of Commons, uh, to spread to other uh, MPs and peers. I approached Professor Richard Layard from the London School of Economics, who is a world expert on, on well-being uh, and well-being economics and mental health economics. And he approached Professor Martin Williams from Oxford University, uh, who wrote, Mark wrote uh, a piece in the Forensic World. And uh, he, brought, he came to Parliament and he started our lessons about four and a half years ago. Since that time, 150 members of Parliament and Lords, British peers, have had mindfulness training. 250 members of their staff, and in a separate but parallel initiative, 3,000 civil servants, some of them the most civil, senior civil servants in the land in Whitehall, have had uh, training through the actions of a great civil servant called Marion Fur. So Gandhi said, be the change you want to see. So um, after practicing for about two years, we decided to have an inquiry into the uses of mindfulness. Uh, and how it could help British society, British economy, and the British people. So we took, uh, we had 80 witnesses from around the UK and some from international witnesses in eight sessions, um, and we gathered this information together and we made recommendations to the uh, to the government, which I'll come on in a moment. Uh, I'll come to in a moment. The report has got 240 references, many of them scientific references, in the back of the report. The report is available online, and when you go into those references, they ping out to give you the full statistics. It's been widely, uh, 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 the report has been widely welcomed uh, in the UK and around the world and is seen as best practice. And I would like to see uh, politicians in other countries do their own mindful nation report. At the report, we, we were a cross-party group, so it's, it's uh, left, right, centre. Uh, we have people from different religions. I'm a practicing Catholic. We've got Jews, Muslims, Hindus, lots of atheists and agnostics. I think they're particularly attracted to mindfulness. So it's cross-party, cross-religion. And uh, the lady on the left, uh, speaking at the rostrum by herself, that's, that was the previous education cabinet minister, minister, the Secretary of State for Education, who spoke at the launch of our documents. We had five conservative ministers attending our uh, launch. Three of them spoke, 
including the previous Labour co-chair, Tracy, Couch, Tracy Crouch, who spoke openly about her depression. She came off uh, antidepressants and turned to mindfulness. And she was not castigated for this. In fact, she was later promoted to be the uh, Secretary of State for uh, uh, or, or the Minister for, for, for Sport in the UK government. So we, we operate on a cross-party basis. And the law, uh, the, our uh, Mindful Nation report looked at mindfulness in the criminal justice system, in education, in health, and in the workplace. And we made some recommendations to government, which we thought were achievable. We didn't go overboard. We made some key recommendations. I'm pleased to say that many of these recommendations have been agreed by the government. Uh, they have agreed to the training of an, of an extra 400 uh, mindfulness uh, counsellors in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. The, uh, we've raised the issue again uh, of education, mindfulness in education, in Parliament, and the Minister has agreed to go and visit a school and actually meditate with the children. Uh, in the private sector, in the workplace, we, the Mindfulness Initiative has gone on to develop another report called Mindfulness in the Workplace, cooperating with some of the biggest names in UK industry, Jaguar Land Rover, HSBC, uh, Smith Klein, uh, uh, Smith Klein Benson. Uh, so we've had great rapport with the private sector and in the criminal justice system, we've actually had a national UK coordinating committee with representatives from the fat mindfulness community to see how mindfulness can ha help out in the jails. We thought there were six prisons that operated mindfulness. When we looked into it, there were actually 30. So we're looking at what the best practice is, what the best science is, so that we can spread it to all of the jails in the United Kingdom. In the UK, we, we weren't the first to develop mindfulness in our political system. Uh, the, the chap on the right with the US flag is uh, Tim Ryan. He established mindfulness on Capitol Hill in 2012. I believe in Anne-Marie Broden, a conservative um, politician, a conservative member of parliament in the Swedish parliament, she started her practice uh, for the 350 Swedish MPs in 2011, and 35 of them, or 10%, went on a mindfulness training course. Whilst I was uh, an MP, I worked with uh, a Conservative Member of Parliament, I'm a Labour Member of Parliament, a Conservative Assembly Member in Wales, Darren Miller, and he set up a practice group in the Welsh Assembly. I visited the Dutch Parliament, and on a cross-party basis, they established uh, mindfulness practice in the Dutch Parliament. Again, it was about 13, 14% of the MPs went on a training course within a six-month six period. I also visited the German Parliament, and uh, the, the lessons have started in the German, German Parliament in January of this year. So after I left uh, Parliament, I didn't get elected in 2015, I continued my mindfulness work on an international front on a voluntary basis. I visited the Australian Parliament, uh, and Jack Heath, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of SANE Australia, who took me out there. I met with 12 Australian MPs who were very interested. The timing wasn't right because it was just before your general election. And I wish to visit the Parliament again to see if we can get more interest uh, with Australian MPs from the new intake. Also, I've worked with, I'm currently working with mindfulness advocates in about 40 different uh, countries across the world who wish to take mindfulness to their politicians. From July last year to December last year, I visited the French Parliament, that's the big picture there, and spoke to French uh, MPs, and they're establishing a mindfulness practice group after the French general election in two weeks' time, or three weeks' time. And the, the smaller picture there is very interesting. That's uh, Minister for Happiness and Wellbeing in the United Arab Emirates, Minister Ruomi, who is receiving a plaque with the translation of mindfulness into Arabic. And that's Chris Tamjidi, who went out to, uh, uh, to the United Arab Emirates and helped to teach 200 members of the Prime Minister's staff mindfulness uh, through Oxford University, Willem Kuyken, and indeed Moira Kenny, who is from Australia. The three of them went out there and taught 200 of the Prime Minister's staff mindfulness. So uh, mindfulness is spreading among legislatures around the world. And... I believe this is a good thing 
because Gandhi said, be the change you want to be. If we can get politicians practicing, personally practicing and benefiting from mindfulness, they will become that change and they will automatically, I believe, or many of them will automatically want to spread that change into their own society, into their own education system, their health system, their criminal justice system and the workplace. And just as Lynn is helping to map out the best practice in Australia, I think we should also be mapping out the best practice around the world. And I am amazed at what I see around the world, the best practice. I believe that you have the best practice for mindfulness in universities in the whole of the world. C Professor Craig Hassed, for 26 years, has been uh, practicing mindfulness with students, and he's kept the scientific, he's kept the data to prove how beneficial that is. In the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, Professor Mark Williams, who I mentioned before, introduced mindfulness uh, for repeat episode depression. Uh, he, he did this 13 years ago. Um, so if these mindfulness interventions are known to be beneficial, are scientifically proven, why haven't they been taken up in other countries around the world? And I think if we develop this international network of mindfulness practicing politicians, and we send them the best practice, we meet on a regular basis, we know each other personally, we swap the science, we swap the research, we swap the policy, then there is a much, much greater chance of that mindfulness being taken up around the world. So um, there is great interest out there, and we hope over the next one or two years that we will have about 40 countries whose politicians will be practicing mindfulness. Once again, I pay tribute to the work that Lynn and others are doing in Australia in promoting, promoting mindfulness and also compassion and empathy. I know is a key aim for Lynn and for many of you out there. And she's helping me develop my uh, uh, compassion and my empathy and appreciating the science more. I've been mindfulness focused. Uh, obviously, mindfulness brings forward compassion and empathy, but there are there is much research on compassion and empathy that I think we need to examine as well. Uh, and I think if we can do this, if we can operate and cooperate nationally and internationally, we've got a much great, greater chance of creating, as Mark Williams would say, peace in a frantic world. So thank you everybody for participating. If there are any questions you wish to ask, uh, please fire away or type away. So Peter Ewell is asking uh, Chris, uh, so saying thanks Chris for your presentation and the work you have done. In our instant world, there may be someone who thinks that quite a bit of mindfulness is a ticket to a calm and considered decision making, etc. But the practice takes time and commitment, and it takes time to re rewire our automatic responses. You mentioned that you have been working on this for a number of years. Are you seeing fellow parliamentarians and senior executives take a long term committed approach to the practice? Yes, as I mentioned, there's 150 members of parliament who have been on the course, um, and more courses planned over the next uh, over, over the next year. We also uh, we have a fantastic teacher called Chris Cullen, and he does this voluntarily. He travels in from Oxford University on a Tuesday at one o'clock. He takes the uh, members of parliament staff at half past five. He teaches, uh, or, or, or he uh, we have a, um, a continuing mindfulness practice session for MPs and Lords who have been on the course before and at quarter past seven he uh, he takes the new MPs. So I think a key integral part of, of keeping up that practice is having this ability on a regular basis to practice together and it just does change the dynamics within that group. I'm not saying it's the age of Aquarius and where peace and love and happiness is breaking out but when you sit and meditate in a room with up to 25 MPs from different political parties and we express our vulnerabilities in front of each other when you're in the chamber when you're down the corridor and you meet those people from different parties there's a different dynamic so i think a key part of uh, keeping keeping the practice up over time is having that regular practice which you know for us half past five on a on a tuesday is the regular time for for mps to gather and sit together and i know this is the way that uh, Tim Ryan operates on Capitol Hill. Uh, he's got a small band, uh, but a band that's been practicing together now for about uh, uh, five or six years. So uh, 
keeping it up over time is absolutely essential, critical to uh, to developing that long term practice. Yeah, so those connections are already happening. Uh, also, on uh, June the nineteenth, uh, Professor John Cabot Zinn is coming over to the UK. He was, uh, and he's coming to the British Parliament. Uh, he was going to meet politicians from around Europe and around the world on the 20th, but that's been put back to October 17th because of the general election. On June the 19th, he is meeting with the vice chancellors of some of the top universities in the United Kingdom to specifically look at mindfulness in higher education. And to, uh, uh, Craig Hassad will also be delivering a lecture on that. So I'm hoping at the end of that day, uh, best practice will be drawn up uh, and perhaps you'll be able to share and tap into that. Um, so th th this is happening on, on an international basis as well as a national basis. And I see a, a golden opportunity to influence those young minds, many of them which uh, of those students are highly stressed. They will be going on to uh, be, f be future leaders in the world. Last week I Skyped into a conference in Harvard University in the Kennedy School of Government specifically aimed at influencing uh, some of the future leaders in the United States and the world. I think it's a golden opportunity to, 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 to reach out those, to those people and help balance themselves, those young students, knowing that they will go on to senior positions uh, around the world and will have benefited by mindfulness and will be able to pass mindfulness on in their positions of authority. Uh, so Deborah Rice asked to uh, Chris, are you seeing a change in the way those MPs are dealing with legislation? Any examples of better policy uh, decisions across, uh, you know, instead of political point scoring? Because I think this is actually an important um, question too. It's like um, you almost need a critical mass within organisations to shift them and you need a critical mass at the leadership level. Um, I know my son works at one of the, you know, major four banks, and they run a 24 or a 20 minute, you know, mindfulness session once a week. But then he's got to go back into a very um, competitive uh, environment. So I suppose, Chris, part of it is where does the tipping point come to see those changes? On that, uh, there are MPs who said it has changed the the, the, the dynamic how they operate. Again, I don't want to overclaim for mindfulness in the political setting. Um, you know, the, the people that have been on it uh, have given testimony that they have changed. Um, but I think it's also perhaps just as important, or maybe more important, is the work that Marion Fur has been doing with senior civil servants of the United Kingdom. You know, an MP, I lasted for 18 years. I think the average life of an MP is nine years. Uh, at a ministerial level, probably one year. Um, and I think if we want to embed it in the political decision making, the the initiatives we're having with the uh, with the uh, senior civil servants are just as important as with the politicians. And if we've got both of them there, and also their researchers who are who are advising uh, uh, MPs and ministers on a on a daily basis, we've sprinkled the whole political decision uh, political ecosystem with mindfulness. And it's early days. And again, I don't want to overclaim for it. But we have seen uh, the effects in policy uh, already with these extra 400 mindfulness advisors and consultants and, uh, in the National Health Service and counsellors being uh, trained over the next year. We've seen it with more openness in the prisons to accept and spread mindfulness. So I would say that change has come about, change is coming, up, coming about, but it's not just through politicians, it's in the whole ecosystem. Thank you very much, Chris for taking time and uh, we very much look forward to the network developing as we go forward.